Thank you very much. Good to be here. Um, so my name is Laura. I'm an engineer at CodeShip. Uh, if you haven't heard of CodeShip, we're a continuous integration, continuous development company. Um, but lucky for you, I won't spend much time talking about CodeShip today. I'm going to talk about Docker. Um, if you want to talk to me about CodeShip, you can find me after my talk. Um, I have some stickers that I'll be happy to give you. Um, today we'll talk about developing applications with Docker. We're going to cover a couple things. This is going to be really, really introductory, designed that if you are just curious about Docker, interested in how it works with sort of a normal development workflow, this is the talk for you. If you've used Docker before, I hope you still learned something. Um, but we'll start kind of at the very, very ground level. Um, so we'll talk about what Docker is. We'll look at Docker files, writing Docker files, understanding what the heck is in them. Um, we'll move on then a little bit higher level to Docker Compose and Docker Machine and some other tools in the Docker ecosystem that make working with Docker a lot easier for you. And then finally, we'll wrap up with a really simple web application that I'll live code on stage for you. Um, so you can just see how simple and straightforward it can be using the Docker ecosystem tools to get set up with containers. Um, I want to emphasize that everything that I'll talk about now is not going to be a specific solution for your particular problem. I want to emphasize that the patterns that I'll show are really useful. And even though I might be coding in a different language, you can take the pattern and use it for whatever your use case is. Um, so we can just jump right into an introduction to containerization. Um, if you've heard about containers and containerization, chances are you've probably heard about it in context of this happy blue whale up, up on screen. Um, this is, of course, Docker. The Docker logo is very recognizable. I want to make really clear before we get any further that Docker is not containers. They're not the same thing. Um, Docker is a tool kind of on top of containerization, which is the um, kind of mechanism. So Docker will manage your containers for you, but Docker is not a container. Um, it makes it really hard to talk about things like this when we don't have common vocabulary, so I just want to make sure that we all agree on, on what exactly we're talking about. Um, Docker will build your images. Docker will start containers for you. Um, Docker also has tools like Docker Compose that will manage many containers at one time. Um, and you can even provision machines to run containers on using Docker Machine. But again, Docker itself is not a container. Um, and if now we want to know, well, what is a container if Docker is not a container? Um, a container is sort of like a virtualization layer. Um, you can think about it that way. It's very common when you're first starting out to hear container is a virtual machine, just like cheaper and easier. And I think that gets you OK. I think it's a little, a little simple. Um, and we'll talk about maybe some of those reasons. Um, so it's sort of a virtualization layer. If you think about it as like a very tiny VM, you are maybe halfway there. Um, and it's a good analogy when you're first starting out. Um, there are a couple things that are really unique about containers, which make them really cool to work with. Um, so containers at their basis are just a self-contained execution environment. That's all it is. It's just sort of a place where your code is running in isolation from other stuff. Um, so if you think about a virtual machine as sort of like this, that's, that's where the analogy and the comparison really, um, really starts. Containers also share the kernel of the host system, but they are isolated from other containers. Um, and because they're so small, they're really fast. They have really fast load times, really low overhead to get containers up and running um, with your application. So we can look at a web application kind of with the traditional virtual machine, each service on a virtual machine, and then look at it how it might change if we introduce Docker into our workflow. Um, so this is sort of ca normal, maybe, uh, virtual machine setup. So we have our infrastructure somewhere, AWS, DigitalOcean, something. Um, we have a host OS and hypervisor. And then we can think of each of these three columns as sort of a service. So server 0, 1, and 2, they're each running kind of in their own little virtual machine stack. They have a guest OS. They have libraries. And then the service is running on top of them. So very clear to see what's doing what. Um, if we take the same application and maybe transform it into a situation where we choose to use containers instead of dedicated virtual machines, we can take away some stuff. Um, but you'll see at the top, we kind of have the services there as we'd expect. Instead, we'll have in infrastructure on the bottom. And uh, you know the infrastructure has a host OS. Um, but we'll introduce something kind of at the bottom layer called the container runtime engine. Um, and then 
on top of it, it kind of looks the same. So we have similar patterns and similar divisions, um, just sort of implemented in a different way. And I will say that doing this, um, if you're either taking an old application and putting it, sort of containerizing it, moving it over to a Dockerized workflow, um, or if you're starting out with a new Greenfield project and choosing Docker right away, it can seem that using containers is maybe not worth the effort. It seems really complex at first. Um, and, and I totally agree with you, but I will say that once you can get past the initial kind of learning curve of figuring out what tools are the best, how should you implement a certain thing, it can greatly reduce the speed that you need, um, or the speed and space um, needed to run your application. So things are faster, and you don't need as much space. You can get more infrastructure utilization. So the sort of too long, didn't read version of the introduction to containers is that containers allow you to spend less time provisioning your stuff, less time rebooting, less time fighting with dependencies, and just more time working on code and building stuff. Um, I used to work in research and development, as was mentioned in my lovely introduction. And working in R&D is like you're paid to break stuff all the, all the time. So using Docker in R&D was really great because the worst thing that would ever happen is that I would maybe have to restart a Docker container. I didn't have to wait for virtual machines to boot all the time and have to wor worry about like getting into a weird snowflake state with stuff that I'm working on. I just couldn't easily dump the container, restart a new service, and it took less than five seconds. Um, it was really, really helpful in my development workflow, and I hope that it can be just as helpful to you. So let's look at some of the Docker tools and the Docker ecosystem and how you might introduce them into, into, your, um, into your projects. Docker focuses on three main, um, kind of three main functions. We have build, ship, and run. And what I'll show you today sort of falls into this first category, the building part. Um, shipping and running are also super important, um, but we have to build something to ship and run first, so, so we'll do that together. And the first thing that we talk about when we talk about starting a Docker container is the image. Um, this is another place where vocabulary makes things kind of difficult because some people confuse Docker and containers and also con confusing the word image and container. Um, and people af often ask me or make the mistake of saying, are images containers? Can I share a container with you? Um, and that's not really the accurate way to represent it. An image is sort of like a class, and the container is the um, instantiation of the class. So if you think of the image as the thing that you want to build, and then the container is actually the code running. Um, you put images on the hub, or you share images with your coworkers. You don't ever share containers with them, because the containers are the things that are actually running the process. Um, and if you're curious where you might find images, um, if I mentioned just sharing them, you can look at the Docker Hub, which is Docker's public registry. And there's tons and tons of images on here to get started for your first Docker project. Um, this is just a snapshot I took yesterday of some of the most popular official repositories. Um, and you can see some pretty popular things, um, Docker registry being, being one of them if you want to run your own private registry. But of course, you could pull down Nginx run it, and then have Nginx available for your project without having to write your own image to run Nginx. So there's lots of things like Ruby, Rails, um, Python, Django, Golang, et cetera. Lots of these official images that are um, maintained by the communities are up on the Docker Hub, available for you just to pull down and use in your project right away. Um, I think this number is actually probably a little low, but at, at one point, there, was around, there were around 15,000 images, so I think there's maybe probably closer to 20. Um, in addition, the registry can kind of function as um, a like a GitHub repository for your project. So it's common that you might have an image, change it, and then push it to a registry. And then you can give other people access to that registry so that they can be um, using the code that you've, that you've created without having to go through too many steps. Um, you can use it on the CLI, of course. There's Docker push-pull, um, just like you would with GitHub. And then you saw the GUI before the Docker Hub web page that you can go and browse and search through the registry to find the image that you want. Um, I want to point out there are a couple of different kinds of images, especially if you're new to Docker and don't quite know what you're looking for. You want to make sure to kind of keep this in the back of your head. So the first type of image is probably what you'll want if you're looking for something like a database. Um, this is a, what I call a service image. It's sort of self-contained 
ready to just run and be available for your project. So if I say Docker pull Postgres, and then I run Postgres, I have an actual Postgres database ready for my project. Um, this is different from a project base image, which is something that you pull down from the hub with the intention that you have to add other code in order to make it work. Um, Golang is a good example of this. Other language-based images are good examples. So you could pull the Ruby image down, but if, unless you have some Ruby code to run, it's not going to get you very far. Um, this can be confusing, again, if you're kind of new and don't know quite what to look for. Um, but almost all of the images on the Docker Hub have excellent documentation, so um, always look there. And then, of course, official images, as you saw in the screenshot earlier, are maintained by the communities that sponsor them. So for example, the Rails uh, official Docker image is maintained by the Rails community. But what if you want to use your own stuff? Um, this is probably what most of us want to do. So you need to start with what's called a Docker file. And this is a set of instructions to build your own Docker image. The, um, the way you build it on the command line with Docker is Docker build. And then you can say dash T for tag. Give it an image name. And then one thing that's really hard to remember when you're first starting out is you have to pass in the directory where the Docker file is. So um, you have to give it something, in this case, a dot, because I'm where I want to be. That will build. And then you can run Docker images to see all the images that are available on your um, kind of local Docker environment. We'll go through all this in, in an example a little bit later. So don't, don't be overwhelmed if, if this is a lot. Um, I just want to go through a couple instructions in a Docker file and talk about what actually makes an image work. Uh, this is a really, really simple Docker file for a Rails application. Um, so we can kind of go through these instructions one by one. I picked out the most common, most important instructions that you'll see in a Docker file so that we can just talk about what exactly they're doing. Um, so when you go in to write your own Docker files, it's a little bit easier. Um, this is a from image. Every single Docker image has to start somewhere. Um, in this case, this is a Rails project, so I'm going to use the existing Rails image in order to build my application on top of. So I'll say from Rails. It'll pull the official Rails image from the Docker Hub. And then on top of that, um, oh, I should note, notice that the version is set right here in the Docker file. Um, I don't ever have to ma mess with like managing multiple versions at the same time. It's just right in the Docker file. You can only have one version. So this is really handy. Then if I want to update the version of Rails, I just go to my Docker file, change the version tag, and then I'm set to go. Um, next is the maintainer, which is, I guess, optional, but I think it's really important to put in <laughs> that you're the one maintaining it so that people can contact you and ask you questions about it if that's something that they need to do. Um, the next command is a run command. This is just running make dir and making a place for my code to go. Um, I'm going to use that new directory that I just made in this next command, which is work dir, which stands for working directory. Um, at this point, we're just sort of in the root um, directory, and I want to specify that all of my commands should actually execute in context of the application that I'll, that I'll eventually load into this container, which is going to live in var app. So I need to tell Docker, you should look in var app for all the stuff that I'm going to tell you from this point on. Um, and of course, the next thing we'll do is copy um, one of my local files into the container file system as well. So copy will just take your file, put it inside the image. Um, there's also add, which does some other magic. If you're ever confused about add versus copy, you probably want copy. Um, so now we have a gem file inside of this image build context. And then I'll use the run command again to do a bundle install. Um, this will just execute bundle install. And then I can, with the command or CMD, command instruction, say, please start this. When you, when you run this image inside of a container, please start it with Rails S and then bind to this address. But building all of these by hand and maybe pulling down Postgres, firing it up, building your Rails image by hand, firing it up is a little tedious. And who has time for that, really? Um, so I want to say that using the Docker ecosystem tools kind of on top of your own code is a really, really powerful way to, um, 
to work really fast. So you can use Docker Hub in combination with your own Docker files to make and store the images in your project. And then I'm going to introduce this tool called Docker Compose, which you can use to kind of glue everything together. Um, and if you are familiar with Docker, you might have probably already heard of Docker Compose. It's a really, really popular tool. It used to be called Fig. Docker acquired um, the, the team that created Fig and, and kind of rebranded it as Docker Compose. Um, so Docker Compose is a YAML file, essentially. or It's a tool that, I guess, allows you to write YAML files that serve as application templates. So instead of running each container individually by itself, you can just define all the requirements for your container, containers in one place, and then start everything at once with just one command. So this is different from not using Docker Compose, where you have to start each container individually. Docker Compose sort of glues everything together. And then through Docker Compose, you can run all of your services at once. Um, Docker Compose also has additional tooling to help you view logs, run one-off commands against certain services that are running, um, and just in general help manage the containers that are already up and running. So taking kind of all of this information dump that I just gave you, we'll put it into practice by building a Rails application with Docker. Um, there are a couple things that we need to set up before we can do that. Um, you might be curious how to install Docker. So I'm going to talk about three ways. First is the old, old way, which is boot to Docker. And if you played with Docker maybe a year ago, over a year ago, you are familiar with boot to Docker. This was sort of their old um, way to be able to run Docker on a Mac or on Windows, um, which was deprecated in favor of something called the Docker Toolbox, um, which I think is still a really great choice. Um, I call it the new old way because Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows is in beta right now and will be available um, for the for public um, hopefully soon. Um, but until that happens, if you don't have access to the beta, you should stick to Docker Toolbox. Um, I'll be using Docker Toolbox during this demo, just because most of you, um, if you're just starting out with, with Docker, probably don't have access to the, to the beta, and there's no sense in demoing a tool that, that you can't use yourself. Um, Docker Toolbox has the Docker client. It has Docker Machine, the engine, Docker Compose, and then Kitematic, which is a UI. Um, to sort of manage your containers if, if you prefer a UI. Um, I personally prefer command line things, but um, there is something GUI available for you. And one thing to note is if you were previously using boot to Docker, you can easily migrate your boot to Docker workload to the new Docker machine. And they have a pretty nice um, script to sort of automate that for you. Um, so you can check out docker.com slash toolbox for the Docker toolbox. And if you are interested in the beta, you have to kind of apply for an invitation. You can do that at beta.docker.com. Um, so without any further ado, we'll get into kind of some live, live demo, live coding. I'm going to um, start a multi-container app using Docker Compose. And the services in the app are going to be Rails and a Postgres database. Um, before I do this, I want to say that this sounds like a crazy, big, scary thing, but it's, it's really not. And also, this is going to feel exactly the same as if I was doing local development. Um, I'll still be able to view the app running in my browser, edit files in a local um, environment, see the changes in my browser, run things like rake tasks and migrations, et cetera, whatever else I might have to run against my Rails service. Um, and I can see log output via Docker Compose. Um, I'll explain quickly how I can get these services to communicate with each, with each other, because it still maybe sounds a little bit crazy that you have Postgres sort of running off in its own container and Rails running off in its own container. Um, and the answer is that you can link containers and declare dependencies. Um, also, environment variables are your friend. Um, the great thing is that Docker Compose makes this really easy. Um, we'll talk about the Docker Compose file that I'll run for you. I have two services. As I said, I have a database, and then I have a web service. So the database is up here at the top. It is a Postgres database. And then I have my web service, which is just building the Docker file that we went through um, a couple minutes ago. You can see here that I'm linking the database to my web service so that web knows database exists. Web service will also get a bunch of environment variables set by Docker, pointing that, that, that show 
and tell um, the web service where to find the database service. So the IP address, port, et cetera, all the addresses will be shoved in environment variables and made available to, uh, to the web container. Um, one other important thing, I'm mounting my code into this container as a volume. Um, this is how I can edit it on my computer without having to rebuild the image every time. If you remember the Docker file, we only copied the gem file. We didn't copy anything else. Um, instead, at runtime, I'll just link it as a volume. That way I can work on it on my local machine and see the changes reflected. Um, one last thing. Um, I guess that was a, a lofty promise that we're going to do live coding right away. I have a lot to explain to you before. Um, one thing, is, here's an example of one of those nice uh, environment variables that are set by Docker. So we can see DB port, um, port 5432, TCP adder, is going to be the host address of my database. Um, so it's not, Docker won't magically do everything for you, but it will get you most of the way there. You're going to have to know kind of how things talk to each other anyway and implement some things, uh, some things yourself. But as you can see, it's not, it's not super challenging, and there's excellent documentation uh, for all this stuff. All right, so for real now. Um, we'll go over here, and I'll just show you the Docker file that, um, oh. sorry, we'll, we'll wait a little bit. Um, all right, great. So um, make this a little bigger, I suppose. We have database and then the web service, just as we saw in, the, um, in my slides. And we can remind ourselves of the Docker file again. I'm based on this one. I actually am choosing Ruby instead and then um, kind of installing all the stuff that I need to to make it work. Um, Docker Compose, oops, Compose up. Um, I'm going to give it dash D because I don't want to see all the log output. I kind of want it to run sort of in detached mode in the background. Um, but we can see that was super, super quick. And if we say Docker Compose PS, you can see that I have two um, Docker containers running right now. So I have my database one running, and I have Rails running. And I see that I have forwarded. 3,000 to 3,000, um, I should be able to go here and see Rails running. OK, so that was pretty easy. Um, but of course, that doesn't get me very far, because now I just have a really easy Rails app and none of my actual code. Um, lucky uh, for us, we can run one-off commands against any service that's running with Docker Compose. So this is a Rails application, and I want to run a Rails generate for a new model. Um, so I can say Docker Compose run web, and then follow just by the command that I want to run. Um, so I can run a scaffold for puppies, dogs, I don't know. Um, and we can say that each dog has a name, which is a string. And we can see this will actually run everything. I don't have Rails installed on my computer at all. This is all just running inside of a container. Um, but Docker Compose makes it easy to sort of bridge the gap between your local development environment and the way that you normally develop um, to running everything inside of a container. So that's great, but I now have to run a migration. So I'm going to do just exactly what I did before, um, Docker Compose run web. Uh, rake, db, migrate. And we see that my nice dogs migration has been run. And now I should be able to see this. Great. Um, and if I go to dogs, that's cool. I can make a new dog. Maybe his name is Rufus. Sounds like a good dog name. Cool. So now I'm able to sort of see everything in the browser. It's all running in Docker um, on a Docker machine. But I'm still able to sort of pr preserve my normal development workflow. Um, the last thing I want to show, just maybe, um, is that you can change um, 
stuff <laughs> in your local file system. So remember, I have this mounted as a volume inside of the container. So I can edit things locally um, via whatever text editor I want on my local computer and then see the changes kind of bubbled up to the, um, to the application that's running inside of a container. Um, so I want to maybe just change this dog's light. Oops, not that. Um, what is this? HTML. Cool. Um, so maybe I will change this to say I really like dogs! Exclamation point. Because it's true. Um, so now when I reload, I can see that my changes locally that I did just like in my terminal window via Vim are up and running in real time kind of in the container that I have um, run via Docker Compose. So your normal development workflow is self-contained or sort of stays the same, but yet your application can run um, with Docker, which is a really powerful tool. Um, I will take questions. I guess we have 27 seconds left and then some time for questions. Um, I hope this was helpful. I'm happy to answer any very specific workflow question that you have. Um, after the talk, just find me. I'll, I'll be here all day. I also have some code ship stickers to, to give away if you're interested in that. And I will hand it back over to Mike. Thanks, Laura. Okay. Okay, I have some questions. Uh, first one, I think quite interesting. Uh, do you use Docker in production environment? Yes, um, I do use Docker in production. Um, lots of people are using Docker in production, and you might have heard of tools like Kubernetes. Um, there's a so actually Kubernetes is probably the one that's most popular right now. People are talking about it a lot. A lot of people started working with Docker because of the promise of really efficient production workloads. So instead of having a single VM for each service, you can now run 50 services on a single VM. So it was a really easy way to save money. Um, I think most people kind of in the beginning became interested in running Docker specifically in production for that reason, and then sort of retroactively stepped back to running testing and running development in Docker. Um, so yes, I've been running Docker in production since version 070, which was maybe not a great idea at the time, but I worked in research and development, so what can I say? It was fun. OK, there is another question from Bartosz. Uh, can I install Docker Hub in local network company? Um, you can install your own copy of the Docker registry by going, get this, to the Docker registry, <laughs> downloading the image for the registry, and then running it in your kind of secure network. So that's a common, um, common workflow. If you don't want to push everything up to the public Docker Hub, you can certainly run your own copy of the registry for private use. Um, it's also worth noting that the Docker Hub, sort of the public registry, also has private repositories. So you kind of like GitHub, you can push to the, to the Docker registry, but still have some sort of you know, private registry, if that's, if that's good. Most companies that have proprietary code or, or don't want to use the Docker Hub run their own, run their own registry. OK. Uh, do you use whole shipping pipeline, build, ship, run uh, as automat automated CI application deployment? Um, so one, do I use it, or does it exist? Do you use um, it, yeah. Yes, I do. And in fact, that's what CodeShip does. So um, it's not maybe as CodeShip is sort of one component that you can can stick in kind of at the end. So you can take something that you've run um, and then decide that you want to use CodeShip for CI and CD. And then we'll manage sort of all the pushing to um, the hub, building your images, running your automated tests, et cetera. Um, Docker also has a couple solutions. So they have their own um, cloud, data center, et cetera. Um, if you've worked with Tutum before or heard of Tutum, Tutum is now a part of, of Docker, so sort of their Docker cloud. So there are lots of options to kind of take you from development all the way to production in an automated way. OK. And so one, more, one more question. Can I have a run with removing container by default? Yes, you can, dash, dash, rm. So, um, OK. Yeah. There were a couple more questions, but I strongly encourage you to ask Laura uh, after the speech, her speech. Thank you very much.